What is it about having a great meal time together that's relaxing and enjoyable? Really just a cool time to just like reframe life. We go around the table and we talk about what was the best part of your day. If we were home, we had we sat around the table and had a meal together. It gets super cheesy sometimes and like, tell me one thing you love about your brother. I had the same three meals, you know, like just over and over and over. We try to make it where we don't talk about work at all. Who was the best behaved of the kids? Oh, me. Jesus, the night before he died, he sat down uh, and had a meal with his disciples. There is something about being able to just sit down and have a meal with somebody that is just disarming. I've been in several groups, and I've seen both sides. Your group actually becomes your family. It's a commitment, really, from everybody that's just like, if we're going to be a part of this group, we're going to be in each other's lives. Well, hey, everybody, uh, I want you to note how amazing I look standing in front of the cloud triangle thingy back there and how it's just going to add an entirely new dimension to your worship and your learning today. Just keep note of that. Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, I also want to note that that little video piece that runs right, but that ran right before me was uh, a little promo, uh, subtle promo for our podcast. We just started podcasting last week and we it'll release, I think, Wednesday of each, uh, each week. And so check that out. It's where we're deepening the conversation. We're going to take the subject matter matter from Sundays, talk to campus pastors, staff, people from around One Life, and just have a conversation about how we can explore these things on deeper levels. So this past summer, I have to say this, um, I, I learned, I learned, I relearned a lesson that uh, it's, it's one of those things I knew before, but now just because of what I went through and some things I observed, I, I would say it's, it's deepened down into me where it's really just been tattooed on my soul in ways that it never had before. And it came about in a couple different ways. One of them was a light way. I had shared that uh, my wife and I, we sold our house uh, after living there for 18 years, raising our kids there and all that. But not only did we do that during the summer, but we um, sold off about 80% of our stuff. We had an auction and just downsized and did that whole deal. Now, that taught me about the concept of worth, okay, uh, and relative worth and value in things. And just because of the way we had to do it, we had to get our house ready, we had to get ready for the auction, I spent almost all my spare time during this past summer putting things in boxes and moving them around, okay? So taking them to storage uh, units and then bringing them back out and then taking them back and putting them in boxes and moving them around. And here's what I've learned about worth, the more you move your stuff around, the less uh, value it has in your eyes. It just does. It's, it, the only regret I have with, uh, with our auction selling off 80% was I was thinking, why didn't we just sell 100%? I don't really care. We've got a storage unit full of stuff now. If I found out today it was on fire, I'd be like, don't call anyone. Don't call anyone. Just, just let it go. Just let it burn. It's a God thing. It's just, a, you know, as you're moving stuff around, things go down in value. They do. Your stuff is not worth nearly as much as when it's just sitting there and you're so proud of it in your living room. So that was a worth thing. That was a light uh, kind of part of the lesson. But the other one was a little heavier. And I shared this a few weeks ago that uh, just this past summer, um, there was an above, in my life, there was above average number of funerals, uh, both for my family and, and for just people that I know and, and, and all that. It was just, it was, there's always that kind of cycle in life, but it was way above average. And I found myself in that setting a whole lot. And um, it pressed into me again, something that the Bible declares, but I just want to press into you that life affirms today. And it's this, and I, and I fear saying it because I don't want to sound cliche, because we're going to spend our, the rest of our morning trying to get away from the cliche of it. It's that the single most valuable thing in life, without question at all, that the Bible declares and life confirms, is to know Christ. As I've watched and I've listened and I've processed and I've, and I've seen people, and this, this week did it to me again. We had uh, all kinds of things that were happening and heavy conversations I was in. I watched people at One Life go through very, very deep and heavy things and hard things. And, and, and it just keeps getting repeated back to me all the time that the single most valuable thing in life is to know Christ. And I'm not talking about the kind, uh, kind of knowing Christ where, yeah, I prayed back at church camp years ago and I'm going to heaven when I die kind of stuff. I'm talking about a real, walking, living, breathing, understanding, growing, deepening relationship with the living Lord of the Bible, okay? That's what we mean by uh, knowing Christ. Very famous passage that Paul, the apostle, writes 
is, bears repeating, it says this, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. And he's not saying there's nothing else important. He's just saying that when it comes to knowing, it, it, when you put Christ here and put everything else here, there's really no comparison. It makes all the other stuff essentially garbage. And I think that's worth noting. And so here's what I want you to get before you leave. I'm going to give you kind of a threefold thing, and that's the first one is that I'm hoping we'll just re, re, be re-reminded today that knowing Christ relationally and personally is the single most valuable thing you can do. And I wanna ask you a question, if that's really true, if you believe it, what are you doing about it? How are you investing in it? But the second thing kind of goes with that, and I'll explain this further as we kind of travel. It's, if you're, gonna, uh, if you're gonna say that knowing Jesus is the greatest thing of all, you have to remember that he is another to be known. And what I mean by that is that, I, I'm, I'm getting old and, and grumpy these days. I, I've, I've developed a pet peeve in life. I hear a lot of Christian people say, well, it's all about Jesus, it's all about Jesus, we just need to know Jesus. And I, and I couldn't agree more in one hand. But on the other hand, sometimes I wanna say, what do you mean by that when you say that? Do you mean the Christ that's revealed in the Bible and is another, or are you just kind of co-signing him to this relatively nice guy that's out there somewhere that gets you to heaven when you die? It's a great quote by a guy named Tim Keller. He's a pastor out in New York. He says, if your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshiping an, idol, an idealized version of yourself. If your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. So when I talk about knowing Christ, I'm talking about the one that is other, that is a person outside of you who has personality, who has choices, who has values, who has direction for your life that sometimes you won't agree with. And if you find yourself, you're, oh, he's just always agreeing with you, you may not be reading him closely enough. So with those things in mind, then I'm going to give you a third thing, and I want you to take it away today, but those are the first couple. What we're going to do over the next few moments is I'm going to read a passage, and we're just going to study it with, uh, with the goal of knowing Christ better. And what I want you to do is I want you to kind of pretend that as we read this passage, that you've never heard of Jesus at all. You don't know anything about him. And you're listening to this story for the very, very first time as much as you can if, you've never, uh, if you have heard it before. But I want to, uh, uh, there's one uh, 19th century scholar named J.C. Ryle said this about the passage we're about to read. He said, nowhere else in the Gospels do we find the Lord making such a formal, systematic, orderly, regular statement of his own unity with the Father, his divine commission, and authority, and the proofs of his Messiahship as we find in this discourse. In other words, what, you're gonna, what you have here in the passage that we're about to look at today is one of the greatest statements by Jesus about himself. Getting back to our goal of knowing him as the greatest value and remembering that knowing him is knowing another. He's not, he's not me. He's someone else that I can know who has values and everything else. So with that said, uh, I'm going to read the first paragraph and give you a little bit of a head start. Um, look at this. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, says this. Sometime later... Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which was surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now, b before we go any further, what I want to do is that we, we have a value around here that we say we believe you can bring your brain to church, okay? And what you need to know about this, and I'm going to give you a little, uh, one little insight into knowing Jesus and, and knowing him as the other, is that he is historical. Every now and then I think I need to remind us of that because we, we're filled with a culture that you can go on YouTube and you can find a bunch of guys out there doubting his history and basically saying that what you're doing today is you're participating in a fairy tale. And I like to remind you every now and then that you're not. And this is a great opportunity. This passage, uh, it, it, this little paragraph, this setting that we're about to watch in this, um, in this event that we're going to look at in Jesus' life, um, this, that description, these, this bath, this pool called Bethesda, was all the way up until the 19th century, from about the beginning of the Enlightenment to the 19th century, was viewed as made up. 
because there was no historical or archaeological evidence that it, ever, that it was ever there. They thought the writer, whoever he was, just made up this pool, these five colonnades and all that sort of stuff, just to kind of place Jesus in a thing. In other words, it was a fairy tale all the way up to the 19th century. Well, then in that t- at that time, they were doing some repair work under a church that was built around the Dark Ages in Jerusalem. And someone got to dig a little further down in the foundation and they found something else down there. They were digging and digging. Well, they kept digging and they kept looking and they kept studying. And this went on back and forth for about a hundred years. And finally, not terribly long ago, they declared, absolutely affirmed that what they had found was this pool. And it's exactly as John describes. They had discovered it, okay? So you're looking at something real. As a matter of fact, they know so much about it now that they can do kind of an artist rendition of it. I've got a picture of it that so you can get a, kind of a sense of place. The Pool of Bethesda would have been a giant area where a lot of people were. And uh, they did ceremonial washing and that kind of stuff in there. That's what it would have looked like. Let me give you a quote that I, I saw on this kind of stuff from a guy named Eric Myers. He's a Duke University prof. He says, quote, I don't know of any mainstream scholar who doubts the historicity of Jesus. And the details have been debated for centuries, but no one who is serious doubts that he's an historical figure. You need to remember that because you'll get a lot of knuckleheads out there on YouTube and whatever else that will say he's doubted, but out there in mainstream real thought, uh, they do know he's one of history. So keep that in mind as we go. So here's what I'm gonna do for, for, the, for the remainder of the reading. Again, you're on assignment. Just, just imagine you've never heard of Jesus before. And we're going to read quite a few verses. You're going to watch him do something, and you're going to listen to him say some things. But think about just what do you notice about his personality, his values, what he's interested in, what he thinks about himself, what he thinks about life, what he thinks about people. And we'll discover and we'll know him a little bit better. Now, one was there, there at the pool, had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and he learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Now, just a little editorial note there. Some older versions of the Bible will have a note that says the belief was that an angel came down and stirred the waters. It was actually springs that were doing it, but people back then thought they did. Now, the earliest, most reliable manuscripts don't have that note in it. It came a lot later, so that's not, it's why it's not in the newer versions, okay? So, but he thinks that when the water stirred, If I'll get there first or if I'll get in there at all, I'll be healed. Then he continues. Verse 8. Then Jesus said to him. (laughs) I like the way he completely ignores what he, he just said. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. After 38 years, he picked up his mat and he walked. Now the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat? All the while, the guy's just been healed after 38 years. And this is the discussion they're having. I think that's fascinating. The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. There seems to be a tie between that little stiff thing that he said and him going, hey, by the way, it was that guy since there's trouble happening. So because Jesus was doing this on, these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work. And to this very day, I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the father doing, because whatever the father does, the son does also. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed." For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. That's quite a defense. That all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Very truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And this is a beautiful thing to say 
and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life, has crossed over. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he's the Son of Man. Then he finishes up this way. Do not be amazed at this. <laughs> yeah, the nice, nice try. You know, you'd be like, what did he just say? Don't be amazed. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice, talking about his own, and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. Judge, I only judge as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. It continues on in the original chapter, but that's plenty, okay? What'd you come up with? If you're reading about him just cold, I noticed a few things. If I want to know him. First of all, I noticed he's powerful. That's kind of taken, you know, kind of taken for granted in this. But he's compassionately powerful. If you look at other passages as well, you, you, Jesus, what you need to know also is that historians, even skeptical historians now, they're so convinced that he lived. Not only that, they are convinced. Even atheists and other historians will say, we don't believe he actually did supernatural things. What we do believe that his contemporaries believed he did. In other words, Jesus was a wonder worker and he's known that way as a miracle worker, which is fascinating. So he's powerful. And think about that. If someone had the power to do that, someone's been laying there for 38 years and all he says is, uh, get up, and he gets up. You might at least listen a little closer. Like, hey, I think he's got something going on. Imagine that you have something as profound as a guy there 38 years, and I assume that it's, it's noted because most people knew that. They were used to seeing him there. It was a very common place to go. You would walk through there. This is a guy that was a part of the scenery and comes along and says, get up, pick up your mat. But you also need to, we need to differentiate between Jesus and the other. First of all, his power is real, it wasn't illusion. But also, any miracle that you see Jesus does, it always has a twofold thing. Number one, you'll always see compassion for people. It's always related to that in one way or the other. I mean, these guys, they just do things that are just kind of, they make you go, wow, that guy's a trip, you know, that kind of stuff. But Jesus did things that had compassion for people and ultimately, every single time he did a miracle, it was a revealing of him. Why? Because the most important thing in all of life, period, is to know him. And all the miracles that are reported and all the miracles he would have done, they were always designed for a greater thing. Showing, because later on, you saw in the dialogue, there's coming a time when when the dead who are in their graves are gonna hear the voice of the Son of Man. Well, that's quite a claim. But if he just raised someone who had been lying there for 38 years, you would at least give his words a little bit more thought, wouldn't you? That's important to note. The second thing I noticed about him is not only is he powerful, but he's also controversial. I I love the fact that he told the guy to pick up his mat. Now, why would he have to pick up his mat? Like, hey, you're healed. You know, oh, by the way, pick up your mat. You know, clean up after yourself kind of thing. But we all know why he did it. Because he knew that the religious leaders would kind of walk by and go, hey, what are you doing carrying the mat, right? And he did that on purpose because the entire dialogue is based on this debate over Sabbath law. Now, I'm not gonna go in that a whole bit, a a whole lot, but you've probably heard it said before that in those days, because they took their religion seriously, I don't throw rocks at it necessarily, they wanted to make sure that people did not work on the Sabbath. But of course, people would always raise the question, what's work? If I brush my teeth on the Sabbath, am I working or not? And they actually had laws around. They had to think through stuff like that. There was one case where they said, you could, if you gave anybody money on the Sabbath, you couldn't call it a loan because that was a working transaction. So you couldn't use the word loan. So you'd probably say, I'm, I'm loaning, giving this money, but loaning it to you just kind of secretly, and they would give it back. But they watched that stuff because they didn't want to violate it. But isn't it also fascinating that Jesus did it on purpose? He does it on purpose just to raise the conversation. And it is is a fascinating conversation, isn't it? Where they're watching someone who was just healed miraculously after 38 years. They're standing there, and there's no evidence that they deny the miracle. It made me wonder, you know, how do you get to a place where (laughs) you're, you're seeing the man, you're seeing the miracle, and all you're thinking about is the mat? Now, about that time, I get kind of proud because I'm a modern person and I don't struggle with those kinds of things like those poor Jewish people did back all those years ago. 
So I can accept Jesus as controversial there. Let me give you another controversy that I noticed, and maybe you noticed it too. Remember, it's about knowing Jesus and remember he's other. And there's things he does that you probably won't agree with, and I bet I found one in there. You notice when he came back, Jesus finds the guy. And what does he say? How you like being healed? Where are you going first? Bless you. God loves you. No, what did he say? Hey, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. It's just all about Jesus. Jesus loves all the little children. Did that offend you? Hey, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now, before we delve in too too deeply into that, we need to note that just a few chapters later, Jesus is asked about a guy that he's going to heal who's been born blind. He was asked a very direct question. Who sinned? Was it this guy? Was it his parents? Someone had to sin. And he says, no, it wasn't. But he doesn't deny that it can never happen that way. And I think if you and I will think about it, in your own life or in lives of people you know, have you ever done things that you knew for a fact were sinful, but it had a very adverse effect on your life, physically, emotionally, and otherwise? We know that happens. And I don't know why he, I wonder, we're not told he was born that way. I wonder if the guy's original problem was rooted in whatever he was doing, because he, he felt the need to warn him, said, hey, and maybe, just maybe, I don't know, that he got up and as soon as he was well, he started drifting right back to whatever that activity was that may have led to that. Now that's offensive and it's hard, but it's Jesus as other. Remember that. And the final controversy is this though. Why did they persecute him? Because he claimed to be, quote, equal with God. There's another thing I see you know, out there on YouTube and everything else. A lot of times Christian people that we talk about the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus never claimed to be God. We, we say that Jesus was God walking around in the flesh. He never claimed that, except right there almost very, very directly. I mean, it's not hard to see at all. The Jewish leaders got that part. He said, he, he called God his Father. He said, my Father, and, and, they, and they, they started, they didn't only want to give him a hard time. It says they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him. Why? Because he had blasphemed. One scholar, there's a whole lot smarter than me um, that I love. His name's Leon Morris. He's a Cambridge guy. And uh, um, he says this about this passage, quote, Jesus was not here teaching that God was the father of all. The Jews would have accepted this. He was claiming that God was his father in a special sense. He was claiming that he partook of the same nature as his father. If you were paying attention, you saw that. The son, the father, he he equates those two back and forth. This involved equality. So Jesus held, uh, so the Jesus held that he was guilty of blasphemy. Or the Jews, I'm sorry, the Jews held that he was guilty of blasphemy. He goes on. They discern that the Sabbath breaking was no isolated, rootless phenomenon. It proceeded from Jesus' view of his person and consistent with it. The Jews looked to a habitual attitude, not an isolated act or word. They fought him on this uh, this Sabbath thing all the time, but they could tell it was rooted in something more than, hey, I want to work on the Sabbath, you can't make me not. It was rooted in his obvious self-identity, that who was he? He viewed himself, and you saw it in the dialogue. He says, the Father does this, and I do this, and I don't do anything without him, and he and I are just, are just of the same nature. We're, we're, we're walking that way. Now, why should you care? Because it goes back to the original statement. If what he said is true, we're not just playing games here. The single most valuable thing in all of life period, is to know, and that means have a relationship with, follow more passionately, relate to more deeply. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one that's presented in the scriptures to us as the other. We need to remember that. And the question is, what are we doing about it? Did you notice the claims that he said? He said, first of all, he's the judge and, and this goes back to C.S. Lewis is famous for giving this Lord, liar, lunatic thing. Where, and that's where he gets that kind of stuff from. If, he's, if, if this guy really said this stuff, it's not just casual conversation that anybody would say. Did you notice? 
He said his voice was going to be the voice that raised the dead at the end of the age. He claimed he was going to be the judge that assessed your life. And he was going to raise some to live and some to be condemned. So it's not even remotely exaggerated to say the single most valuable thing in all of life is to know Christ and to know him as the other. (laughs) Now here's the thing. We're in a series called The Table. And up until now, I've not even used the word table. What's that got to do with the table? Well, some of you may not know what we mean by the table. Table's a metaphor for the local church. What the Bible reveals about that God came up with this, believe it or not, God came up with this idea of the local church, like a gathering like we have right now. It's God's idea. Revealed in the New Testament. What's that have to do with any of that? Well, first of all, I know that the local church struggles a little bit. We've all got stories. Any of us that have spent much time in the local church, we've been hurt. We've been disillusioned. We've, we've watched hypocrisy on display as if people were getting paid to do it, right? We've seen it happen. A lot of people say, I can get to know Jesus and I don't need church. You can be a Christian without being in church, going all that kind of stuff. We, we've all heard this stuff. We've said those things. We believe those things in many mild ways. We don't consider this all that important. What's this have to do with the table? We have a little saying around here. We do life in groups and teams, number one. And we believe that every group and team should help people trust and follow Jesus. Put this together. If the single most important and valuable thing in all of life is to know Christ and knowing him as the other, as he's revealed in scripture, not as an extension of myself, not as a generalized nice guy that I sort of believe in out there somewhere that agrees with me on nearly everything I've ever thought about but is the Jesus of, like John chapter five, who claims to be the one who will judge all. Then all he asks for ultimately is to have a gathering of people who get together regularly in one another's lives and sit at the table and he gives you permission. Do you notice what he said? If you believe on me, you've crossed from death to life. You have crossed. If you believe in what he did on the cross and his identity of himself and his resurrection from the dead, you have entry. That's how you have entry to the table. And that's all, that, that's all it takes. It doesn't take being good looking. It doesn't mean, take being rich. It doesn't mean how much good you've done or whatever else. You have a place at the table. And then what the conversation at the table is supposed to be is about him. It's helping one another get to know each other. We also say this, we believe that every team or group should help people trust and follow Jesus. In other words, if you volunteer in the nursery, which we thank you very much and please more of you do that, okay? If you volunteer in the nursery, you're not just back there to volunteer in the nursery. What we've assigned our leaders to do in the culture that we dream about because we believe it's based on this is that we want a place where if you go and you're taking care of babies but you're talking to other adults and everything, that you guys talk to each other about what? The single most important thing in all of life. If you volunteer in guest services and don't they do awesome or these, these bands that we have, the drummers and even the bass players, people who do and serve and go to groups and everything else. You're not just supposed to be there to play bass as tempting as that is. You're there to interact with others, not just as family and nice people, but how can we lead our conversations to do the single most important thing in all of life, which at the table, he's the head of the table. Because did you see what he claimed about himself? You guys need to process that. We all need to process that. His claims weren't to be, I'm the nicest guy in the universe. You might want to follow me if you get time. He said, your entire existence comes down to him, period. And so why wouldn't we have a collection of people at the table talking about what that means? Some of you are veterans. You've walked with him for a life. You've learned a lot. I said I relearned a lesson that's been pressed into my soul just this summer. I've got a few things to share. Some of you have done doing this for a long time. You need to talk to the younger and say, here's what I've learned about knowing Jesus, not just about general niceness, not just about religious opinions that are out there somewhere, but about knowing Jesus personally and walking in. Here's what I've learned. Here's what I see in the word. Here's what I see inside the Bible when it says how it interacts with my life. 
Here's how it's got me through tragedy. Here's how he's changed me or shaped me or molded me. Here's how I know him. That's what the conversations are supposed to be. So with that said, here's what I want to do across all three campuses. I'd like everybody just to bow their heads and close their eyes, and we're going to have a prayer time, okay? And I'm going to just give you three prayers to pray that if you want, you're a free person, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to do these, but if you so choose, based on what we just said, in your own words, in your own way, in your own heart before God himself and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the sum total and end all be all of reality. The first prayer I would want to give you to pray is this, just in your own way. Lord Jesus, please help me to know you and give me a way that's new in my life that I'm not currently doing, that that would happen. Maybe you do avoid the Bible. You haven't been in it. Or maybe you need to join a group. Maybe you need to take more time for prayer or fast or just ask him, Lord Jesus, I want to know you more. Give me something that I can step into that I'm not currently doing that would lead to that end, not just vain activity, but really, truly knowing you. Just take just a moment to pray that in your own way in silence. The second prayer is this. This in your own way, say, Lord, use my life to help others know you. If that's the most important, valuable thing there is, period, then use me to help others get to know you and show me what that would look like, maybe younger people or just people that are around me, just in conversation. It doesn't have to be you know, major ways or anything like that. It can be subtle. It can be conversational. But pray that he'll use you to help others in your life know him better. And finally, Pray for our church. Local churches do struggle with a lot of the things we listed. Ours is no different. But pray that our church will, in the end, be a place where people can come to truly know, relationally and deeply and profoundly, Jesus as the other, how he reveals himself, not just how we want him to be, but how he really is. Pray that God will do a new work in that way in our church. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. You're mysterious. You're interesting. You're powerful. You can be a little frightening. You can be deeply compassionate. You take us through things sometimes we don't want to go through. But Lord, open our eyes. Help us to see you and know you and be so obsessed with really truly knowing you that that becomes the truly most valuable thing in our individual lives and in the life of our church. And may we communicate that to those outside of here in new and profound ways. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.